Hello, my name is Mike Easter, um, and I'm from RMIT University in Australia. Um, I'm very, very honoured to have been asked to do the Light Metals Division lunch um, for TMS in 2021. In fact, um, I was very disappointed that um, I wasn't able to make it over to the US last year for, for this. Um, I guess RMIT was one of the first places to stop travel due to COVID. Um, I guess the in hindsight, that was a good decision, um, but I've always very much enjoyed um, traveling to TMS each year and getting to know and to see um, all of my colleagues from around the world. Um, definitely one of the highlights of my year each year. So it's great to be able to be back um, even in a virtual format um, in 2021. Now, what I would like to do today, I guess it's a lunch talk. So. Um, I wanting to give a bit of an overview of, um, I guess, near net shape manufacturing of light metal alloys. Um, and I guess it's been a, a bit of a theme in, in a lot of my research over my career. Um, and I guess that what near net shape manufacturing has meant has actually changed over that time. I, but I also want to talk a little bit about how some of the themes of the research can travel from from one, I guess, manufacturing technology to the next, to the next. Um, so they're the things that I'm really wanting to focus on today. So a bit about me and my career. Um, I did my PhD at the University of Queensland, um, finishing in um, early 1999 um, with the CAST Cooperative Research Centre. And I guess for a large part of my career, the CAST Cooperative Research Centre was a, a big part of it. Um, and I guess I travelled all the way from being a PhD at University of Queensland um, to being the CEO just before um, the, um, the centre actually closed down in um, 2013. Um, the other things that I've done, I've spent time at Camalco Research, um, as it was called back then, or Rio Tinto Aluminium, um, where I spent a fair bit of time looking at ground refinement optimization. Um, I've worked for many years at Monash University, um, particularly on alloy design, and I had a big theme of looking at magnesium alloys during that time. Um, I spent time at LKR um, in Austria, um, where um, again, we looked at some grain refinement issues, but particularly one of the things that I guess was most exciting was doing some billet casting there, um, extrusion billet, which we actually took back to Australia and, and did some trials with the, some of those alloys. And now I'm an Associate Dean for Manufacturing Materials and Mechatronics, or Triple M at RMIT um, in Melbourne. Um, and I guess the big focus of, of a lot of our work now is in additive manufacturing. And so I'll talk a bit about that um, as, as the talk goes on as well. So what is near net, net shape manufacturing and, and why do we, um, I guess, want to do this? So in terms of a definition, um, near, net, no, near net shape manufacturing is a term given to processes that aim for the initial fabrication of a component to be close in size and shape to the finished product, All right. Um, this approach reduces production costs and times um, associated with subsequent finishing steps such as machining um, and raw and initial raw material investment costs. Near net shape manufacturing is particularly appealing for co components manufactured with high value materials such as titanium alloys. So we will mention a little bit about titanium alloys, but. Um, a fair bit about aluminium um, and magnesium alloys as, as well today. So I guess here's some new net, sh net shape manufacturing processes that I've, uh, I've been involved in over my time. I guess starting out um, during my PhD, I spent a fair bit of time looking at, um, well, permanent mold casting, sand casting um, of um, aluminium alloys. Um, both in terms of um, microstructural refinement, but also in terms of defect formation and control. Um, I spent a fair bit of time then looking at um, high pressure die casting and particularly designing magnesium alloys for high pressure die casting, um, but also a fair bit of aluminium high pressure die casting um, as well as, as part of that. Um, and I guess both of these are near net shape manufacturing processes. Um, sand casting, um, much slower um, cooling rates, um, much, much thicker sections, 
Um, die casting, high pressure die casting, um, I guess is probably one of the most optimized manufacturing processes, even though um, there can be some issues in terms of um, um, you know, defects and um, microstructure and those sorts of things. Um, but very high production rates, um, many, many parts can be made very, very quickly. And much more recently, um, we've been looking at additive manufacturing. Now, one of the, th the things that I wanted to, to mention here is that I guess that often the story of additive manufacturing is talked about as a comparison between subtractive manufacturing. So subtractive manufacturing, such as machining, which maybe is not so good, a lot of waste and, and all of that. Additive manufacturing, where we just put the, the material where it needs to be. Um, but I actually see it a little bit differently, and I guess it comes from my history, that um, I see it really as a, a, an extension of near net shape manufacturing. Um, so rather than being, um, you know, I guess the, a, a contrast with subtractive, I actually see it as more of the, a continuation of the near net shape manufacturing um, story where um, we are um, really putting material where we want it to be. Um, and I guess increasing the complexity and making much more complex near net shape parts. I guess the other technology that's often talked about with near net shape manufacturing is forging. Um, I guess I'm not talking too much about it because I've done very little research in, in the area um, and I tend, I've tended to look at the solidification based processes. So there's challenges with near net shape manufacturing, um, getting the tolerances right, um, and the surface finish right is, is quite important. And I guess usually that means that um, there is normally some sort of machining um, step at the end of a near net shape manufacturing process. And I guess that's why it's called near net shape rather than just net shape manufacturing. Um, we've got to deal th with things like residual stresses and distortion. Um, microstructure and defect control is, is really important. And the other thing that we're trying to do is get properties in the as fabricated state. Um, so the parts made and then it can be used. Um, often that is not the case that we might use heat treatment or, or something like that to improve the properties. Um, but generally um, what we're trying to do is to reduce the number of process steps. Um, and that includes any of these post-processing operations as well. Now, I think in a very early version of near net shape manufacturing, um, I guess we can see in Xi'an, China is um, in um, the facility or the, the area where they have the terracotta warriors where they've actually found some of these ancient Chinese bronze castings. Um, this one um, is over a ton, um, 1,061 kilograms in, in size, is about a quarter um, life size, um, and is quite a spectacular um, thing to actually see and think that it was, this was actually done over 2,000 years ago. Um, so, you know, near net shape manufacturing um, has been, you know, being done for, for a long period of time. Now, if we look at it more modern, in a more modern way, um, as I said, my career started in aluminum castings, looking at things like um, um, automotive wheels, um, but you know, I guess engine blocks and other um, powertrain components are often made out of aluminum alloys these days. Um, and I guess that we see that over the years there's been an increasing complexity um, to these castings. Now, I, last year, there was an announcement by Tesla where they were talking about, um, they're actually going to say, saying that they're moving, moving robots aside, aside. So no longer um, robots, you know, assembling um, car bodies anymore. Instead, they're going to just cast the bodies in aluminium. Um, and I guess that this has been something which I know has been talked about for, for quite a few years, um, but you know, Tesla are now doing it. So, or planning on doing it. So um, good on them for, for, for doing that, you know, very large um, complex castings. So I spent a lot of time also working with magnesium. And I guess that there was, there's a number of things that is good about magnesium. The, um, Magnesium castings, or at least in high pressure die casting, we tend to increase the fluidity, we get thinner walls, um, we can move to larger castings than aluminium. 
Um, I guess that the cross car panel or instrument panel is, is one of the, the good examples of that. Um, but there are also many other um, examples of, of um, magnesium alloys being used, um, you know, even in high temperature applications with you know, alloys like A44 um, and you know, Corvette engine cradles and engine covers and tunnel brackets and, and all these sorts of things out of magnesium. Okay, additive manufacturing, I guess, takes this to a whole nother level. Um, maybe on the right hand side of, of this, um, this slide, we can see, I guess, what looks like, I guess, more normal things that we would see, like, you know, brackets from aeroplanes. But then when you redesign it into additive manufacturing, you don't have to think about how you're going to machine it anymore. You can actually really put the, the, um, the material where it needs to be. Um, so we can, um, you know, in the top right, we have a, a, a bracket for an aeroplane um, and you can see the redesign, um, you know, substantial weight savings. Um, on the, the left hand side, we can see a whole lot of complex um, parts um, from um, heat exchangers through to, um, 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 you know, chemical reaction, um, you know, tubes which which breaks up the um, the reactants um, and controls the the, the chemical reactions, um, but also we have at the the bottom, um, and I guess this is a big area for additive manufacturing, um, where we have um, orthopedics, so um, orthopedic implants, where um, I guess there might be tumors um, in in bones, um, where we can actually um, build parts that have the same properties or very, very similar properties to the bones um, by using ladder structures. Um, and um, there's a lot of examples of um, this in terms of, you know, in femurs like in this one um, or in hip joints. Um, 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 in Australia, we've done things like um, heels, but um, facial implants. Um, so th there's lots of examples. Um, and really that this is just another example of a near net shape manufacturer. Um, and bottom right, I guess is you know, maybe a different um, technology, additive manufacturing technology called laser direct energy deposition, um, where we use um, blown powder. Sometimes we can use wire as well. Maybe we don't get quite as um, complex shapes um, but still, um, you know, it's layer by layer, um, near net shape manufacturing. And we can see um, an as manufactured part on the left and then the, the machine part on the right. So I guess that when I was thinking about this, um, and this is very much a schematic, um, is, is thinking about um, near net shape processing. And I guess in terms of casting, we, we have a, a variety of processes from highly complex, which produce parts, some with more complexity and some with higher productivity. So if we look at investment casting, we get quite complex parts, um, but the productivity is very, very low. Now, then we can move up through low pressure die casting, permanent mold casting, um, which tend to increase the productivity. Maybe the complexity is a little bit less than what you might be able to get from an investment casting. Um, and then we've got high pressure die casting where you've got a bit more complexity um, in some ways. Maybe you can't get the thick sections that you might in low pressure or, or permanent mold casting, um, but you get quite thin sections, you can get quite large castings. When we look at additive manufacturing, um, we've got the laser powder bed fusion techniques, which have the high, really high complexity, um, but very, very low productivity. But then there are other processes such as laser um, direct energy de deposition, you know, cold spray technologies as well, which we um, increase the productivity of the process, but the complexity goes down a bit. And there is definitely an overlap here now um, between some of those additive manufacturing processes and some of the, the um, lower volume type casting processes. Um, of course, um, we, 
you know, we also need to think about things like, you know, what are the properties like, um, you know, the integrity of the builds and all those sorts of things as well. So this isn't everything in terms of um, choice of process, but um, it does help us to understand that somewhat. So what are the problems that we have? It's cracking. Um, so um, when we cast things or additively manufacture things, we tend to crack them. So we've got a billet up the top, um, left we've got um, below that injection mold insert which we made out of through additive manufacturing we've got a high pressure die cast magnesium rare earth alloy with crack cell through it um, and then on the bottom right we have um, an inconel 625 alloy um, maybe not a light alloy um, but again we can see you know lots and lots of cracks um, throughout the build um, so that's a problem Prosody is a problem. I guess we, we had pr problems with um, cast wheels when I was looking at that back in my PhD time um, in terms of controlling the prosody and needing to control the microstructure to be able to control that prosody. But in additive manufacturing as well on the right, uh, we've got some parts that we built. You can see the different um, um, distributions of prosody and like in casting and um, other technologies, if we increase the amount of prosody, we tend to affect the fatigue life um, as well. The big thing in additive manufacturing um, has been the control of the microstructure and, and in particular, um, the fact that we tend to get large um, columnar grains that grow across the builds um, in additive manufacturing. Um, this can tend to lead to anisotropy in terms of the properties. Um, it has been shown in some alloys to be affect um, um, the creep response, um, but also you tend to get solidification cracking um, as well. Um, um, so, so there is an interplay between the microstructure control and, and the cracking um, as well. So what I want to do is I want to just highlight a couple of areas of, of my research um, and other people's research where um, and, and trace them across, I guess, casting all the way through the additive manufacturing and, and see how um, you know, similar understandings of um, the science of solidification can actually help us to be able to engineer um, the products that we actually want. So my background in, in grain size refinements in casting, I guess that we looked at initially aluminium, titanium, um, boron, um, and we, get a very, very nice fine grain size in the most aluminium alloys by, by adding um, aluminium or tie bore grain refiners. Um, and in them um, contains nuclear particles, so TLB2 particles, um, solute, um, and the solute is very important in terms of getting, um, increasing the amount of um, constitutional supercooling, which then facilitates more, more grain refinement. And we quantify this by this thing called the growth restriction factor, which titanium has a very, very high um, contribution to that. In magnesium alloys, um, similar magnesium zirconium um, also works really, really well. Um, and that's because of zirconium actually acts both as a nucleant particle when it's solid, um, and also as solute and has that double effect um, just by itself. And the work that we did, we looked at optimization of grain refiner additions in the aluminium systems and the um, development of a, an alloy, um, a grain refining alloy um, called Microserve, which is on the market and is um, doing well um, by all reports. So if we look at additive manufacturing, um, I guess titanium is one of the alloys that we um, is um, there is great benefit in in moving towards additive manufacturing, um, and we can see some of these approaches already being used to to help grain refine these titanium alloys, which tend to have um, um, columnar structures. For example, um, in A, we've got um, the addition of tungsten, which is a growth restricting element. And we can see that there's you know, some grain refinement there. Um, in B, at the addition of carbon as a, as a nucleant particle, and we see some grain refinement of 
titanium, silicon, and vanadium there. Um, in C, um, we've got boron, um, which acts um, primarily as a growth restrictor as well. We've got um, in D, we can see that quite a number of the different alloying elements, um, carbon, silicon, boron, um, chromium, can all grain refine um, because of their solute growth restriction effect. And the one that we focused ourselves on is the effect of copper, where we were able to get um, in laser direct energy deposition, um, grain sizes of less than 10 microns, with, which are very, very fine um, because of the, the copper addition, um, which also acts as a, a very effective growth restricting factor. Similar thing. So we've got um, people who've looked at aluminium 10 silicon magnesium and added um, Thai bore um, to it, titanium. Um, Diboride um, particles, and we get the grain refinement there. Um, in A and B, in C and D, um, we see the, the use of a lanthanum um, hexaboride particle to leave a very, very fine grain structure. Um, we, in E and F, we can see um, the, the use of zirconium hydride nanoparticles, um, which um, was shown in Nature. Um, and the, the extensive grain refinement of a 7,000 year ago there. Um, in G and H, we've got um, the use of scandium um, and we can see the, a good grain refinement there. And then um, we can also see the effect of solute through um, silicon um, in I and J um, and also achieving a, a finer grain, grain size. Now, sometimes it's pretty difficult to, to use those um, chemical means for, for grain refinement. Another thing that um, is shown to be quite effective in additive manufacturing, like it is in casting, is the use of ultrasound, um, ultrasonic treatment. Um, and here's two examples, one of the titanium 6,4 um, alloy, another of Inconel, um, where the use of um, um, ultrasound has um, dramatically reduce the grain size, um, leading to you know, um, a much more homo homo homogeneous um, microstructure as well. So hot cracking and hot tearing, or, or hot tearing, I guess that we tend to call it hot tearing in, in the scientific community, um, is another area of importance. And I guess that there's interaction here with grain refinement. Um, so in billet casting, for example, you grain refine it, go from the coarse columnar structure to a fine acreage structure. And we also get that um, elimination of the hot tear or the, or the crack um, as well. So we can see that this is the case also in additive manufacturing. And this is a 2000 series alloy <coughs> that we've looked at. Um, as we go from left to right, we're increasing the energy density. Um, um, on the, the, the top row is stock grain refined, adding just a standard grain refiner. So nothing special like nanoparticles or any, anything like that. We can see a substantial reduction in the grain size um, to less than half of the, the grain size. And we see down the bottom, um, um, the, the non-grain refined samples along the top where we see substantial cracks um, and then the grain refined alloys where there's a lot less cracking there. So again, um, in additive manufacturing, um, refining the grain size has the, the benefits of, of um, reducing the hot tearing. Now, I just wanted to also talk a little bit about composition um, as well. And to do this, um, I thought I'd just introduce um, hot tearing indicators. So. There's been a few that have been developed over the years. Um, I guess Klein and Davies had a very early one, um, but there's, I guess more recently, there's one that um, I developed, um, which is the, the HTIE, um, which um, I guess we derive from the um, RDG hot tearing model, um, which is basically saying that if between two points, the coherency point or the, and the coalescence point, um, you know, that's the important range. Um, and if we integrate between those two um, over the, the um, fraction solid temperature um, curve, then that gives us an indication of hot tearing. Um, another one that um, has proven to be also, well, very successful is the, the hot tearing indicated by um, cow. 
um, and um, where what the important thing there is is the um, um, the maximum gradient um, which we can see here um, of the the temperature with the square root of the fraction solid. Um, so, so to some degree, this these two approaches are there's a fair bit of similarity between them. Um, so, but it's important just to show this so that um, we can see the importance of the solidification path in the um, determination of whether an alloy is, is crack susceptible or not. Okay, so one of the, our um, big issues um, in high pressure die cast magnesium alloys is we were looking at some um, very creep resistant alloys, which tended to be magnesium rare earth um, rich. Um, so rare earths were the, um, the major alloying element. Now, the original alloy that we developed um, had a very good set of properties and creep properties, but which actually when we cast it, we found that it tended to crack. And we can see that on the left-hand side. And what we did is we um, modified the rare earth um, compositions um, from one, the original one having a high neodymium to lanthanum ratio um, to the next one having a low neodymium to lanthanum ratio. So it became lanthanum rich. And what we were able to do is manipulate the temperature fraction solid curve so that instead of having that very, very large area, um, which meant that it was quite susceptible to hot tearing, we ended up with a much, much smaller area um, of the temperature fraction solid curve that we can see there, um, which meant that the alloy was much less susceptible to hot tearing. So this is also something which has been looked at in terms of hot tearing. I've, I've used um, for additive manufacturing. I've used an example here of Inconel, um, where um, I guess again, not quite a light metal, um, but the, I guess the, we're also looking at this in terms of aluminium alloys and uh, are showing some effect there as well. Um, but what we can see is two batches of Inconel and uh, both within the, the, um, the specification. And on the left-hand side, we see a lot of cracks. And on the right-hand side, we see, see very, very few cracks. Um, and so the question is, what is going on here? And so batch A was much more prone to hot tearing and it has a longer solidification range. Okay, so if we go back to sort of shading in those, those areas, um, I mean, that, that's, that's alloy A and this is alloy B. So we've actually got a, a shorter solidification range. We have a less susceptible um, alloy to hot tearing. Um, and then we can actually go to some computational thermodynamics, you know, thermocalc, that um, um, FaxAge, and they can actually generate these temperature fraction solid curves. And you can start to do some virtual experiments where you um, look at how alloy composition might affect um, the, the, the temperature fraction solid curve and consequently the, um, the hot tearing susceptibility. And we can see here that what it's showing us is that the silicon content in particular is quite important. Um, the neodymium content is um, a little bit important um, as well. Um, but yeah, so we can, we can actually do a lot of these um, um, investigations now without actually having to do a casting we can, or, or a, a build in terms of additive manufacturing. We can do this just from um, computational thermodynamics. So I guess it's a, a success of um, ICMA. So in terms of conclusions, near net shape manufacturing is continuing to evolve from more traditional methods such as casting to more modern methods such as additive manufacturing. Um, many of the challenges, however, are the same. You know, microstructure control, defect formation and control, um, all of these things are um, still very, very important. And I guess that therefore, a lot of the approaches that we've used um, in the tr more traditional technologies um, in dealing with these issues can also be utilized in additive manufacturing. So thank you for um, listening to me today. Um, I've got special thanks to many people at RMIT. We have a great center for additive manufacturing with a, with a great team. Um, at Monash, we had a, a great team of, of um, um, people 
there in terms of, um, you know, looking at microstructure and testing and that sort of thing. CSIRO, high pressure die casting team was, was fantastic when I was working with them and we see their, their um, work here. And there are many, many other collaborators and co-workers, um, Mark Gibson, David Sinjin, um, Su Ming Zhu, et cetera, um, that have also contributed to the, the things in um, this talk today.